we have a special episode of Rappler Talk for Rappler's 10th year anniversary. Since its founding, this is the first time that the four founders, whom we fondly call the Manangs, will sit down to talk about Rappler's 10 years. And because it's such a special occasion, I'm also back hosting. I haven't been hosting anything for Rappler for three years now. Time has flown, but I'm super excited to be here. I'm Natasha Gutierrez. I was former multimedia reporter at Rappler. And today I have the privilege to speak to my former boss and now multimedia strategy and growth head, Beth Rondoso. Hi, Beth. Hi, Natasha. So nice to Hi. see you. I know. Nice to see you. Uh, how are you doing? Oh, um, the the isolation has been hard for the past two years, but um, somehow we've survived. And I should say we also thrived because we're really online and digital. Right, which is basically how and why Rappler began. Right? That's always been the tagline, sort of being online and being so flexible. But that must have been a really, really hard transition for you as well in the beginning. Right now, of course, we've seen its massive success. But going back 10 years, as former executive producer for one of the country's largest and most successful um, TV shows, TV Patrol, and uh, supervising producer for all of news and ABS-CBN, Going from that, going from TV, which has been so established and having made your career in TV that hadn't changed for decades and leaving all of that behind for digital, which was so new at that time, what was that like for you? Um, when we started Rappler, we knew we needed to be um, app-based, cheap, light, and fast. Um, it was going to be more run and gun, quick and dirty. And um, we knew we also needed to adjust our expectations. Um, glossy, went out the door fast. Uh, content was king. And that meant letting things get a bit raw and rough. Um, that's why we're the first to adopt the iPhone as a broadcast tool you can imagine how the eyebrows that were raised when they saw us with our little tiny phones um remember rappler started at the time when the cameras were still big for for the broadcasters in manila um there's there's a photo of one of our former rappler reporters her name is ai makarai uh, that Cesdrilon tweeted about. Cesdrilon came from our former network, um, ABS-CBN, and so did um, Ayi. She did come from ABS also. Um, the cameramen of ABS were teasing Ayi about her thin tripod with a tiny iPhone on top of it. And um, it, it seemed a bit... Um, ridiculous at the time to expect uh, broadcast quality content from that little iPhone, but now that's already well established. Um, so th that was the, the big adjustment. Uh, but also the, another adjustment on the personal level from, from the impersonal, having worked in a huge company like ABS-CBN, and going to a more intimate environment like Rappler, where you know everybody, where the organization was flat, is flat. And so th those are the major things. Did it make you uncomfortable, you know, to go from glossy, to go from literally having all the resources in your fingertips, being able to ask for anything you wanted, graphic? anything really um to suddenly get and i remember the type of stuff we were sending you right poor quality raw like you say raw is a very nice word to, to use but just to go from that to the complete opposite it was like child's play you know did that make you uncomfortable it did but um i'm also a news person um at the end of the day what mattered was shortening the turnaround time so being able to to get that on air as soon as you can and that was pretty easy with with the new technology with social media with the rapplers uh, way of doing things 
So yes, there was a part of me that said, hey, she's not talking like an anchor. She's talking like a college student. Hey, she sounds like a college student. She doesn't sound like your, your uh, top hard hitting reporter out there. That that's the hallmark of all reporters and um, broadcasters all over the world. But on the other hand, maybe her her college voice, maybe her her twenties voice would reach the people that we really do want to reach. Not not the old people, but the young people, the the people in their twenties, the people in their in their teens. And so, while we were very introspective in the things that we did and we argued a lot um maria was the first to say it's a different world it's it's uh you should adjust your expectations you should change your lenses and that that's what we did hmm. and on a personal level actually there's a particular coverage i remember and it was you and me we were covering the Askals football game. And it was, you know, I was the first sports reporter because I was the only one who knew anything about sports. And literally we went and it was a major game. And I remember all the TV crews that you used to work with were there. And it was just you and me and you were carrying everything. And I was running around with an iPhone. You know, on a personal level, how much humility does it take to go from the top boss of a network to literally working with someone like me and literally just experimenting on the field while all of your former colleagues were there. You know, what sort of humility and I guess adjustment does that take on a personal level? It's not so much humility, but the abang, really, the truth. Um, it's it's a sense of pride and um, being comfortable in, in your vision that enables you to go against the tide. And so it's not about um, trying to make the old old clothes fit into a new situation, but finding new attire, new new ways of doing things in this new situation. And, and really, it was more about having fun, ha uh, being proud of yourself, being, being um, thinking out of the box, and if you, you if you don't do it, they're still on top. But if you do, you really get the eyeballs. You really get noticed. And and that's what happened in the Corona impeachment. Um, we were the the what the young and hungry crew that was there early and stayed up late. And you were there, Natasha. You know all about that. Yeah, like being underdogs, basically. Yes. I like that you. I like that you flipped that, right? Because to me, I guess even just saying like, "Oh, the humility that it takes," when you obviously have been very confident in that vision from the beginning, even before me or any of the reporters, we came on board not really understanding the concept, but you guys had to be that confident to be able to stick it out. Was there any point, especially in the beginning, where you began to doubt? what you were doing was there any point where you were like wait is this is this really going to work i'm a breaking news producer so um i started in anc and then did um the the world tonight before i moved on to the main network which is abs cbn and adopted to filipino or tagalog um so in breaking news, you learn to adapt. Um, you have more resources, of course, at your fingertips. You have like 2,000 people who, who potentially can be working for, for the same goal as you are. But a breaking news producer must get around things, must dig under, go around, or go over a hurdle um, to get to the story. So that was the training that i fell upon or i i leaned on in in doing rappler we what we cannot do we found other means to do and you right. know this we, we we always did that if that's an impossible route we find another route 
or if, right. if the story is not something that we can't do, what's another way to write the story? What's another angle to this story? So with that attitude, I guess it didn't really matter to you what the platform was, as long as you were able to get the story out. That's true. But also, it did matter that the platform was online. We weren't measured by the things that, that were used to measure broadcast news. We weren't um, constricted by time. We, we had more than enough time to, to, to talk, to, to expound, to analyze. Uh, I, I lived in, in, an, in an environment in TV news where I literally had to live in an environment where I only had 20 minutes of content and 40 minutes of ads. Oh, that was yeah. one of the most accelerating things that happened. Uh, being free of the constraints of of time, ha giving you more than enough time to to come out with the things that you want to tell the world. Right, and online gave you that freedom. But as we know, things changed and continue to change so quickly. So, is it exhausting to have to continue to change? you know, sort of, okay, now I know what content works in Facebook. And then Instagram comes along and then vertical content comes along and then TikTok comes along. Like I'm a millennial and I find it hard to keep up. How do you do it? Um, actually, we were, la we were late to adopt TikTok mainly because um, we had questions in terms of, of um, integrity and security for, 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 for the platform, but eventually we did adopt it. Um, it's, a, it's an ever-changing world, that's true, and um, it wouldn't have been so difficult, Natasha, if the landscape wasn't poisoned by disinformation and hate speech and trolling. Right. Um, we would have, it would have been okay it would be, have been hard, maybe, but it would have been part of the of the of the job to adapt to the new things that come up. But I think our biggest challenge really was was um, facing our trauma, facing our fears, facing the threat of 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 closure, and really fighting it out day in day out online. Do you miss it? Do you miss the luxury of the early days of not having had any expectations from anyone? You know, you mentioned that if we did, if we if we failed, no one would really have expected anything else. And if we succeeded, it was so much bigger. But now where Rappler is, right? Do you miss sort of that freedom to experiment and to not have ha have to deal with the trolls and all this other stuff that comes with growing Rappler? How do you feel about that? Certainly, um, I think everyone looks back to the good old days when when the internet was for social good, when we were naive enough to think that uh, the bad would not overwhelm the good, when we thought that that the wisdom of the crowd will win or and will prevail. Um, no one, I guess, looks. Back, no one looks back to that time and and are able to say that. No, I don't miss it. We really do miss it. But this is the reality, and uh, this is our life now. And being digital natives and digital adopters, it's our role to make this world this reality something better than it is now to find solutions to the toxicity and find answers to control controlling hate speech and on a daily basis how do you deal with that how do you keep going when it it's exactly what you said it's so toxic you shouldn't ask me. In fact, I, I, I have the luxury of, of um, tuning out when 
it gets overwhelming. It's it's the other guys, uh, especially Maria Ressa, who who gets the brunt of all the attacks, and our social media team, who at a certain point we had to um, send them to therapy because they had been so through so much, and the day and the twenty four. 12 hours of, of garbage is enough to make you feel sick. And that's what happened to them. Right, right. It's, it's, it's insane. You know, even when I was there, obviously it was starting, but just, I think it's the ongoing assault that really does sort of chip away over time, right? But then you go back to the work that you guys are doing and obviously Rappler is where it is now because of that courage and that innovation. Is there, anything when you look back at your time at Rappler for the last 10 years, is there one particular decision or moment that, uh, or perhaps like a, a hard decision you've had to make that stands out to you? Actually, um, not in, in, in online, because online can be, while it, it can be, when while it can be unforgiving when it is live, there are there are many ways of getting around things. Uh, broadcast TV is a harsher, more exacting medium. And um, I, and in Rappler, um, we've, we, we had a lot of experience between all of us. At the start, we had Rupert Ambil, assistant veteran of ABS-CBN. Maria came from CNN and then ABS. We had, we recruited from from ABS also and other and other young reporters. And so that synergy was what um, showed us the way. And and um, what stood out, we actually did quick decisions, but not in the big things. In the big things, we were sure of our of our values. We were we wanted to be live. We wanted to be out there. We wanted to analyze. We didn't want the crumbs. We want quality content that made people think and um, made them understand the world a little bit better. Is there a particular production experiment that you've done that you look back on now and just didn't work? Yes. Um, we started with um almost an hour long newscast that was very similar to the broadcast newscasts of 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 the of the other networks all over the world um and then we whittled it down to 30 minutes and even that was too long right now we own we have a five minute long newscast that we cut up we focus on five main stories of the day which we then cut up and put into our uh, story pages because it's not, the online world is not about time slots. It's about story pages. And so uh, the paradigms, the, the, the environment is so different that we did several iterations and changes and changes until we got it right. And so really the, the, the wrap, that is what we call our newscast. It's not really a newscast. It's um, it's a cluster of stories, top top five stories that we put together, and those stories are then cut up and deployed to certain story pages. And so, at the very minimum, every day we have five stories that uh, capture the world. Yeah, I remember that. I remember, and when you look at back at how much it's changed, it truly has evolved. Um, is there any particular coverage or deployment that sticks out to you? Um, any favorites? Perhaps you know when I when I think about my time at Rappler, I'm constantly impressed about how we were able to cover the elections with such a small team and to really have competed. I think um, you know with the Giants that always makes me proud. But for you, is there any particular coverage or deployment that might be one of your favorites? My favorite will always be the Corona impeachment uh, trial. 
mainly because it tested our our appetite for for challenges and for competition and for doing new things. But the other thing that comes to mind would be the 2015, no, 2013 um, elections where we we had a huge event in in Quezon City where we eventually had um, went to the Unilab Bayanihan ballroom to to do our marathon coverage of the elections. That was the, the election coverage that combined all the bells and whistles that you'd want as a producer, but still remain true to being online for me. I remember that. Those were midterm elections as well. And it might have been the first elections that we deployed that mini satellite truck that you and Rupert built. Yes. <laughs> and everyone was so excited to ride it because a lot of us had never really worked with satellite, but that was really fun. <laughs> um, and for you, just wrapping up, a couple of questions. What moment, at what moment do you think or do you remember looking at Rappler and saying, oh, this is this is something special. This is something big. We've made it. I think nothing beats the Nobel Peace Prize that Maria got because a lot of that also belongs to Rappler. Of course, a lot of it is Maria. We all know that. Um, but, but we complemented her grit and intelligence. We were deserving in a way of... of being her partner in that endeavor in journalism, which brought her to, to a Nobel Prize. I think um, being there um, in, the, in that world stage told the world that Rappler of the Philippines, not, it's not just that we've arrived, <laughs> because that's all fluff and uh, yabang, but tells the world that there are top journalists in the Philippines um, fighting it out in a very hostile environment uh, carved by a government that is almost author authoritarian. Tells the world that we're pushing back, that we're holding the line, and it and the world tells us back that we appreciate your efforts to safeguard journalism and freedom and democracy. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's surreal. It really is surreal. And yeah, in more ways than one, it is It is for all of the whole rapper industry. It's incredible. What is your what is your goal for Rappler? You know, we're 10 years out and I don't even know if we thought, you know, 10 years was doable when we first started. But now that you guys are 10 years old and obviously the future is bright for you and how crazy the timing that the Nobel Peace Prize came on the verge of your 10th year. Where do you where do you hope to see Rappler in the next decade? Um I can only hope for more resiliency, more agility, more creativity, and ultimately um, stronger engagement and responsiveness to our viewers and readers. Because at the end of the day, that's that's why we're here. Um, how will the landscape change is the biggest question. If if are we going to have more of the same? Um, if, if we happen to elect someone who does not really believe in democratic ideals, how will that work out for Rappler? Will, will, that, will that finally break us or will it make us stronger? That's, that's the big question facing us in 2022. I think it's, I think it's so telling that when I ask you this question, the answer is, you know, you're so confident in what Rappler can do. And a lot of it is just dependent on the government 
and press freedom. And I think that's so telling of journalism today. Um, but what's been so heartening speaking to you, Beth, has been that, you know, it's so clear to me that over the 10 years, despite all the changes in technology, in the government, in you know the environment that you guys function in, the core is still the same. It's so great to hear that you guys continue to innovate because it remains a flat organization and you continue to listen to the younger team. And I think, you know, to me, that's what's going to continue your success. And it's been so nostalgic speaking to you. So thank you so much for your time. Um, is there anything you want people to know about Rappler that they might not know as a final, final statement? Um, we actually turned 11 this year <laughs> because we, we, we were formed in 2011. So it's actually our 11th year. But we went beta in 2012, uh, January. Our real anniversary is January 1 because that was the time when we turned on the, the, the site. Before that, we were on Facebook. And remember, Natasha, we would cover um, the, the, the confinement of former President Gloria Arroyo. That is right via facebook yes mm -hmm. yes and you would try to sneak into to the hospital where she was in and um, we resorted to so many um non-conventional ways to to get in and and get a photo or get video of whatever's happening and and we i think people tuned in to us for the sheer <laughs> pleasure or <laughs> Or challenge of watching this group fail, or, or maybe, I don't know. But but uh, we did get some eyeballs there, but but not so much as when we actually went live on our site. Right, right, right. And I think it's and a lot imagine of if imagine if we were still on Facebook. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, I think that's something a lot of people don't know is we did start with the notes feature on Facebook where we wrote our stories, right? Uh, but Facebook is still here, it's still relevant, and so is Rappler. And yeah, I, I look forward um, along with you guys to see where Rappler's going to go in the next decade. But thank you so much for that. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. And I, you know, like many, many others, continue to support Rappler and uh, are excited to see where you guys go. So congratulations on the Nobel and thank you for your time. Thank you, Natasha.